Well, we start a new series today called Lovish, kind of, sort of, maybe real. And we're going to talk the next four weeks really basically about this concept. What, what does it look like when we love the way the world loves, meaning the things that are, that are opposite of Scripture, the things of culture, the things of media, or versus what does it look like when we love as Jesus loves? You know, it was, uh, it was an interesting week this, this past week. I was, uh, I was deep in uh, my Sunday morning, Sunday afternoon slash nap prayer time uh, last week when um, my wife, when I woke up or woke me up and, and told me about that Kobe Bryant had, had passed away and about this story at that time was kind of developing and it was just kind of a weird week. Uh, it kind of, I spent time on that for various reasons every single day, whether it was questions or just different things. And it was a, it was a tragedy. Kobe Bryant, the the NBA basketball player, legendary basketball player, and his daughter, Gianna, and seven others were, were killed in a helicopter crash out in California uh, yesterday, last Sunday morning. And he leaves behind three other girl daughters and his wife, Vanessa. And of course, there's been so much, it's, it would have been hard for you probably to miss any of this coverage. And and we've seen so many stories about this. And, and, and what I hear from those that have been interviewed, those that knew Kobe Bryant, they talked about his love for the game of basketball. They, they talked a lot about his love for the preparation and process of, of what had to happen in his life to become the kind of player he was. And, and almost everyone that talked about him talked about his love of his family. What's been interesting is to, is to watch how the world is, is grieving. And it's almost as if, as best I can recall, in the, in the digital and social media age that we live in, it's, I think it's the first time uh, that this social media generation has collectively grieved digitally. And it's been an interesting process. And for those of you that are in, that are in my age bracket, um, for, for these younger generation, this was their Michael Jordan, right? You know, you hear the comparisons all the time, but this, this, was, the, this was the pinnacle of, of these young people that loved athletes. And it's been interesting to me to see how this grieving has taken place. You see those that have grieved that knew him and, and that there's an aspect of their friendship, family, relationship that's missing. And that's the way that we normally see grief. But what's been most interesting is to see a, a nation of people that did not know him deeply grieve over his loss. And I remember the, the live shots that they had at the beginning part of last week outside of the Staples Center, the arena there in Los Angeles where uh, the Lakers play, and, and just seeing thousands and thousands of people that just showed up because they, they were so moved or disturbed or bothered by what happened that they weren't sure exactly what to do, so they just went there to, to grieve and to mourn, and they were chanting his name, and they were placing flowers and gifts all for a person that they never met personally. And I think a couple of interesting things about that. One, I think, is it call, those type things cause us to consider. On Thursday night, we were privileged because of your faithfulness to give and for us to have resources to do this. We had the, our Greenwood High School uh, basketball team in here in this room Thursday night. They had a meal together, which they do every week. We hosted this week. And it also gave me a few minutes to talk to them. And, and, and we talked about this. We, we talked about when things like this happen, it it allows us a moment to consider. It allows us to consider our relationships. It allows us to consider our effort. But it also allows us to consider our eternity and where do we stand in our relationship with God. And I think that's one of the things that a tragedy affords us. But I think the other thing that I think is important, and I think it will be important as we go through this series, is it allows us a chance to watch how the world tries to figure out how to love. It, it, we're, we're getting to watch people figure out what they think about love. To watch people who are interviewed that said, I never met him, but I, but I loved him. I never met him, but I'm so deeply heard. It's, it's interesting to watch the world in the midst of tragedy to define what love is. I think it's because love at times in our life feels very complicated, Right? Love can feel complicated, and at times we don't know what love is or how to love. And if we all had a, 
had a card. If I'd put a card in every chair this morning and a pen and I said, everybody write down in one sentence your definition of what love is and we read them, I think we would probably have as many definitions as we have people that are in here, right? Because at times, love can mean different things to different people, which means love at times can feel complicated. But here's the good news for us and in light of this series. What feels complicated to us is not complicated in scriptures. And when Jesus talks about love, he's very clear, he's very concise. And so we are not left wanting or needing to figure out what love means or how we are supposed to love. Because the scripture shows us how. And the secret to understanding is to understand how Jesus loved, how he loved us, and learn to love each other in the way that Jesus loved us. It's really that simple, right? But the application of it is so so difficult. So we're starting this series called Love-ish, right? So love being, if you just look for a, for a definition of love from a cultural perspective, it's a, it's a tender, tenderness, a passionate affection towards another person. It's a desire. It's a longing or a wanting to be with another person or to be for another person. It's an emotion that can lead us to deeply care for other people or even a something, but then you take that, I don't know if it's a word, that phrase ish, right? And you add it to anything, and what, is it, what does the ish do? Ish just makes everything vague, right? It's a, it's a sort of, it's kind of like if you ask your kids, did you, did you clean your room? Is your room clean? Well, it's clean-ish, right? Well, what does that mean? Well, it means it's not clean, right? Did you do all your homework? Eh, ish, right? Parents, have you heard that? Only me? You guys are better parents than me. It's a word that simply expresses ambiguity. It takes something that's clearly defined and it makes it undefined. And so in our lives, when we think about love, do we love each other well? Uh, ish, right? Sort of. Maybe. At times. We kind of love and we sort of love. We might love and we might not love. And at times that depends on what we receive from the other person. And as one song famously said, if you can't be with the one you love, just love the one you're with. And I think at moments in our life, if we're honest, right, each one of us has struggled to love. It's Crosby, Stills, and Nash for those of you that are trying to Google it. At times, each of us in our lives have struggled to get love right. And maybe there's, there's relationships or there's moments that we look back on and we think to ourselves, you know, in this scenario or in this relationship, I really feel like I loved well. It was a healthy relationship. But I think we can also think of other relationships in our lives where we did not love well or someone didn't love well. And often at times we have failed at loving and we have not loved selflessly, we've loved selfishly. When you look about this to scripture about this concept of love you go to john chapter 13 and this is where we're going to land this morning i'm going to teach you a little bit about this passage and then we're really going to talk about verse 34 in john 13 so if you will go there with me if you have a weekly guide it's on the back there's also bibles on the back worship center tables and you'll also see it on the screen so you'll have access to these words in john 13 beginning of verse 31 and it says, when he had gone out, Jesus said, now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. You will seek me, and just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. This section of John 13, starting in verse 31, and going all the way through the end of chapter 17, is what's known as the farewell discourse. So it's, it's the setting in the beginning here where we read is in the upper room and, and Jesus and his disciples, the twelve, are there and they're, they're probably sitting around the room in a, in a U-shape and Jesus is at the opening of that U-shape and the disciples, you can read in certain passages, it, 
it gives this word picture that they're reclined. And so they would often recline or lean back on one hand and they would, they would take supper or take communion with the other. So it's a very, very private and very intimate setting. And when you see the beginning of this verse in 31, it says, when he had gone out. This is a reference to Judas, the betrayer, the one that was going to sell Jesus out in just a few short verses. And so it, there's a unique thing that happens. It's, it's when Jesus' final words begin, this, this thing has to take place. And this thing that must take place before Jesus can begin telling these last words to these disciples is that Judas must go out and leave the room. And this is important because his leaving uh, symbolizes uh, that the, the process had been started for Jesus' death and burial, the betrayal. When Judas leaves and he goes to sell out Jesus to betray him for 30 pieces of silver, this sets in motion that, that time of the passion uh, that we know of. And so this, when the scripture says, when he had gone out, this le- Judas' leaving kind of marked the end of Jesus' earthly ministry. And then we get this snapshot in these four chapters of his last words. And then we read as he goes to the cross. And it means that Jesus' betrayal was now set in motion. And you know, we know Judas is the betrayed. Then just the name Judas culturally now means a betrayer. But what's interesting to me is that Judas had, had been with the twelve. He had walked with Jesus and he had talked with Jesus and he had heard Jesus. And, and there's nowhere in the New Testament that tells us that Judas did not fill his, fulfill his obligations as a disciple, which means that he had a role to play. We believe that he played a role in, in how they took care of the money. But this means that there had to be moments where Judas preached and and taught, and helped people understand, and were part of miracles, and and did all the other things that the disciples did, and and you would think that if he didn't do those things somewhere in the scripture, it would tell us, but it it doesn't ever tell us, and so it makes you wonder if Judas ever loved Jesus. It makes you wonder when it was that his heart was turned. We know earlier uh, in the chronology of the New Testament, we read that, that Satan had put it in the heart of Judas to betray Jesus, and so Judas knew it and Jesus knew it at this moment, but you wonder if he ever really loved them. You know, earlier in this chapter, you see, we see and read about the scenario of, of Jesus washing the disciples' feet. And, and it's a beautiful picture of humility, and we'll talk about it in a minute, of service. And he goes around the table. But you wonder what the emotions were that Jesus experienced as a man knowing he was washing the feet of the one that in just moments would betray him. And can you imagine the emotions that, the thoughts that Judas must be feeling as he's leaning back in the the sinless Son of God, Jesus the promised Messiah, the one that was about to go to the cross, the one that was about to shed his blood so that we could have life and hope and peace. And Judas knows in his heart because the Scripture says the devil had already put it there that he's about to walk out of this room and sell out Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, but yet at this moment that Jesus is is washing his feet in the most humble act that anyone could receive. I wonder what he was thinking. I wonder if it was guilt. I wonder if it was hate. Part of me wonders if it was conviction and maybe even regret. But his leading was the catalyst that set in motion all of those events and so it was at this point when he had gone out scripture says that jesus started what we now know as the farewell discourse and this is a the rest of these chapters are jesus telling his disciples the last things he wants them to know they'd been with them they'd walked with them he had taught them they had learned but he's he's got them here and he knows the cross is coming and so these are his last words to those he loved. And he says something to the disciples that would forever change the way they lived their life. And it would forever change the way they would go out and do ministry and continue and carry on the mission of Jesus after he leaves. And it's verse 34, which is the, the catalyst, the key verse in this farewell discourse. He says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. I imagine the disciples being regular guys that had a special relationship with Jesus, I imagine that along the way, Jesus had seen the disciples get love wrong. I imagine that there'd been moments where they 
attempted with good intentions, just like us, to try to love people in a way that, that Jesus had taught them to love. But I imagine there were moments where they would finish with ministry or helping people or being in a village or being in a town and loving on people where Jesus would, would pull them aside and say, hey guys, let me, let me talk to you about how we're supposed to love each other. Being sinful and flawed people like us, I imagine they, they got it wrong. So Jesus tells them that He's changing the rules and that He's changing the way we are supposed to love. You see, the command to love was not new. You read about love and the command to love all throughout the Old Testament. But the way to love was new. Because Jesus says, just as I have loved you. And nobody had ever loved like Jesus before. The disciples knew the Old Testament. They knew the Scriptures. They knew the concept of love and, and God's love and loving. But when Jesus changed the game and He changed the rules and He changed their life when He says, just as I have loved you. You see, Jesus came to show us that real love is a love that acts. Real love is a love that acts. In fact, a great way to understand Jesus' way of love, one way, is uh, to see that it's radically different than the way the world loves. So here's a few thoughts just about some current concepts about love according to our current culture. See, the world's definition of love is that love can mean something different to everyone. However you want to love, that's the way you should be able to love. And who am I to say that the way you love is the wrong way to love? And who are you to say that the way I choose to love is the wrong way to love? We should be able to love the way that we want to love. World-renowned anthropologist and expert on romantic love, Helen Fisher, describes love this way. She's a lead, thought leader in this area. She says, I began to realize that romantic love is not an emotion. In fact, I had always thought it was a series of emotions, from very high to very low. But actually, it's a drive. It comes from the motor of the mind, the wanting part of the mind, the craving part of the mind. The kind of part of the mind when you're reaching for that piece of chocolate, when you want to win that promotion at work. The motor of the brain, it's a drive. And she goes on to say this in concluding this thought. She says, biological drive that takes over, it is an intense craving that is difficult to control. And you see, when the world defines love as is simply biological, and it's, it's just another craving within us. Just as much as I want to have chocolate, or just as much as I can't stop thinking about the pork butt that I've got on my smoker, just as much as I crave all of those things, that's all that love really is, right? According to the world. And I, if I have desires that come from that love, who are you to tell me that those desires are right, or those desires are wrong, even if it's hurtful, even if it's sinful? You see, when we think about the love of the world or the way culture defines love, we have to be very careful that we compare it to the way Jesus loves it and actually to filter it through the Scripture. In the same study, it goes on to explain the ways that our brain will let us know if we are experiencing love. So according to the main thought leader currently in our culture on love, here's how you know if you're experiencing love. One, love makes you feel addicted. I just can't get enough, the song says, right? Love makes you feel addicted. Secondly, love makes you feel obsessed. I guess that's a stalker kind of love. It also says that love makes you experience recklessness, that when you really, really love, you'll, you'll feel a sense of recklessness, a sense of abandonment to do things that you would not normally do. It also says that you'll experience this feeling of a blur, that love is confusing and you often can't understand it or define it. It also says that love is blind. Which we already knew based on some of the women that I see you men have been married to for so long. So eHarmony, the leading relationship matching site, describes love this way. It says love is simply this. Love is chemistry. Love is compatibility. Love is commitment. And love is infatuation. And if you have all of those things, you found love. You see, the love of the world is a, is a love that always feels, but not always acts. See, when we love like Jesus, it's a love that leads us to act. The love of the world is a love that only feels. It's, it's my desires, it's my feelings, it's my cravings, it's my emotions. It's the way I emote with these people that I 
feel these things for, but it does not require me to act. It's a love that's dependent on our feelings, a love that's dependent on our moods. It's a love that's based on chemistry and simply based on compatibility. You see, to love like the world loves, I don't have to act, I simply have to feel. And our feelings never will lead us astray, right? No. I have to feel connected, but I don't have to feel committed. You see, a love that feels but does not act is a love that can say, I don't love you anymore, so I'm leaving. See, because I'm only feeling and I'm not required to act. A love that only feels a worldly love and does not act says this relationship isn't working for me, so I'm finished. You see, a worldly love only requires me to feel. And if I don't feel, I'm not required to act. But Jesus came to show us that our real love is a love that acts. You see, he said, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another just as I have loved you. You see, the love of Jesus always acts. But for us, it doesn't always feel. Meaning, I can love you like Jesus even if we're not connected. We can love strangers, people that we see, that we don't even know that there are no feelings, there are no connections emotionally to someone that we're not in a relationship with, yet we can still love them like Jesus loves. And what is important for us to understand is when we become a follower of Jesus Christ, listen to me, when we become a follower of Jesus Christ, we give up, And we forfeit our right to choose who we will and will not love. Because it's not a love based on how we feel or any desire or longing we have. When we love like Jesus, it's a real love. And it's a love that acts. It's not based on compatibility or chemistry. But it's based on sacrifice. And it's based on service. Here are some of the ways real love acts. Here's the first one. Real love is a love that serves. Real love is a love that serves. We talked about this. Look back in John 13 and verse 3. It says, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into His hands and that He had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside His outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around His waist. Then He poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around Him. This At the time this was written in the culture, there were Jesus and the disciples where this was, without a doubt, the most humbling act you could do for another. This was an act that was typically reserved for a for a slave or someone who worked for a family. When guests would come, they would wash their feet. And so for the Son of Man, the Messiah, to to humble himself in this way, he's He's teaching a lesson. This is what he says to the disciples when he's finished. He says in verse 12, if you'll skip down. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord and you are right for so I am. If then your Lord and teacher have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done for you. You see, the very first thing in this farewell discourse that Jesus wanted to explain and to model and to make sure that they understood was that a real love serves. A real love doesn't feel all the time, but a real love acts all the time. A real love serves. Think about your relationships. Are you serving You see, to love like Jesus is to love through the way that we serve. See, Jesus wasn't specifically telling the disciples to do just as I have done for you, meaning specifically about washing feet. He was talking about humility. He was talking about service. He was saying there's no one who's unworthy of your love. There's no one who you do not and will not need to demonstrate my love to How can you show love in the ways that you serve your family? You were talking all year about growing deep roots and producing fruit. What kind of fruit are you producing in the way that you serve? What about your coworkers or your staff or the ways that you love your friends and neighbors? Are you serving them well in the way that Jesus modeled for us? How can you show love in the ways that you serve our church and our community? I'm going to give you some real talk for a moment. There's 
I really believe this is a year that, that God is going to increase uh, our attendance. I really think that we're perfectly poised. And if you want to know more about that, I'd be happy to talk with you just about some of the, of the numbers in the math. But here's three things that always tell the truth. The number of people that attend and how many seats that are in this room. The number of parking spaces you have. Remember, we're thinking as a guest, we have 30 paved spaces. And the square footage you have in your kids' area. We're at capacity. We're at capacity. And if people come, here's what a guest will tell you. Take out the front row. If a family comes in the back and they can't see five chairs together, they may stay, but they won't come back. It's uncomfortable. If a parent drops off a kid and there's 15 kids in a room that should hold eight, they're not bringing them back. And I wouldn't either. If a family comes and all of us, all of our members have taken up all the paved spots and a guest has to walk through a muddy parking lot, it's a, they're all factors, church. They're all factors. And we need those that are not serving to serve. This is a place that there's, everybody has to do something. Everybody. Everybody has something that they can do and we are so close to turn in a corner where we can go to another service, which makes everything so much easier because then we can serve one and worship one. I know it's difficult for a family to get up on a Sunday morning and to get here and to, to serve in our kids' area because they have to miss worship. And I understand that's a sacrifice. But we're so close in a couple of key areas of making room for more people, making room for more kids, and making room for more families. Jesus demonstrates a love that serves, and in our church context, we have to be people that serve as Jesus serves. Here's the second one. Real love is a love that sacrifices. Real love is a love that sacrifices. Romans 5, 8 says, But God shows His love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You see, Jesus proved His love for us on the cross. He told us He loved us, but He proved it. How did He prove it? by being the ultimate sacrifice for our sin, by being the final sacrifice, by, by His death on the cross, fulfilling the full Old Testament sacrificial system. He proved His love for us. And here's what I want you to understand about sacrifice. And this applies to the way we sacrifice our time, the way we sacrifice our resources, the way we sacrifice our money, is this. Our sacrifice is not measured in what we give, it's measured in what we choose to keep. That's how you measure sacrifice. Sacrifice is not measured in the time I give. It's measured in the time that I choose to keep for myself. Sacrifice is not measured in the, in the money or the offerings that I give. It's measured in the monies and offerings that I choose to keep. Jesus modeled a love that sacrifices. He gave everything. He kept nothing. He was the full and final sacrifice. And a love that acts is a love that sacrifices. You see, we have to move away from a love that's only feelings-based and desire-based and cravings-based and learn to love people, love each other, love our families the way that Jesus loved. And His love is the love that acts. It acts by serving and it acts by sacrifice. See, when we love as Jesus loved, we will sacrifice for others. What sacrifices are you demonstrating to your family through the way you love them? What sacrifices have you made for your coworkers or for your staff? What about your friends and your, your neighbors? Are you sacrificing to show them and to demonstrate them your love for them through the way that Jesus loved? And again, when you think about how this applies in terms of our church, is that church, we have to give sacrificially. We have to give sacrificially. I believe that God has uniquely placed us here and given us a special kind of grace as Community Bible Church. And I think there's so much more that He wants to do. There's so many things that I believe God is leading us to do. But it's going to take sacrifice. The earthly side of that church is it's just, it's just like our family budget. It's just math. We're going to be responsible with what we have but what we have is what you and I give. And I'm grateful that on a Thursday night I can, I can give 25 boys and some coaches a nice meal and, and tell them to consider their own eternity. What an unbelievable privilege. And I can do that because of your faithfulness. But there are more things that we need to do in our community, 
in our neighbor's lives, with the gospel and on this property. And the only way that we can do them is if we sacrifice, if we prove our love with sacrificial giving and test God, as the scripture says. Here's the last thing. A real love is a love that is selfless. 1 John 3.16 says, By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. You see, a, a worldly love, a love that feels, is a love that's selfish. I'll love you if I get this back. I'll love you if you do this, right? You've been in those relationships. It sucks the life out of you. It cripples you emotionally. To be a part of a selfish love of that I have to do certain things in order to get love back. That's not the way Jesus loved. It's the opposite of how Jesus loved. He loved unconditionally. He modeled unconditional love. He modeled selfless love. Our English language, when it comes to defining the word love, comes way short. And when you take the Hebrew and the Greek uh, languages of the original scriptures, there's four ones in the Greek and a few more in the Hebrew of, of very specific descriptors about how they would talk about love, whether it was friendship love or, or family love or sacrificial love or, or romantic sexual love. They all had their own specific way of talking about it. But in this verse... It's the Greek word agape or agapeo, which means a self-sacrificing love. An unconditional love, a, a love that is selfless. You see, the love of Jesus is a love that's selfless. It's a love that's unconditional, and it's a love that is faithful and true. And if we love the way the world tells us to love, we'll love with selfishness that is conditional, meaning I'll love you if. But that's not the way Jesus wants us to love. He wants us to love in a real way, a love that is selfless. Think about your family, your co-workers, your, your friendships, your community. Even our church. You know, great churches, healthy churches, have people that deeply love the church, meaning the body of Christ. You know, as we together journey this year about growing deep roots in our personal lives, meaning we, we go to new places of spiritual maturity, would would part of your prayer be that God would give you a deep love for this church? A deep love for the people, a deep love for the connections, a deep love for the body of Christ, the place that you could come and, and to serve and to sacrifice and to, to have people that are for you, to have people that will journey with you, to have people that will celebrate with you, to have people that will grieve with you? A lot of times that means you and I have to set aside certain preferences about church or what we think church should be in order to love the church the way that God wants us to love. You see, the gospel of Jesus always shows us that there's a different way. And the gospel also shows us that Jesus' way is better. Church, listen to me. There's a better way to love than we've been loving. We've been loving in a lovish kind of way, if we're honest. It's a sort of love. It's a maybe love. It's a conditional love. It's a selfish love. It's a love based on how I feel. It's a it's a love based on what I receive. We have to love like Jesus loved. And the gospel helps us do that. Will you choose to surrender your attitudes about love with me and learn to love like Jesus loved? Will you join me on this journey as we talk about how we can love with our service and with our sacrifice and with our selflessness and learn to love each other in the way that Jesus loved? It may cause us to change how we think about each other. It may cause us to change how we think about somebody that doesn't root for our team or somebody that doesn't root for our political opponent. It may cause us to change how we see or how we think about our neighbor or someone at our jobs. But don't you want to be people that love like Jesus? Don't you want to be a church that loves like Jesus? Because we don't have time for it this morning. But you know what the end of that passage says? It says what? They will know us how. By our love. They'll know us by our love. The way we get along, the way we sacrifice, the way we're selfless, the way that we're for each other. That's how people that are on the outside of faith, people that are searching for hope, people that are searching for peace, people that don't have a relationship with Jesus, the game changer is how they see us love. How they see us love each other. So will you with me choose to surrender our attitudes of love that are worldly and culturally and, and let's be people that love like Jesus. 
where you choose to open your heart and allow the gospel of Jesus Christ, His example of love, will you allow it to change the way we love each other? And will you consider that there are times in our lives when our love is conditional and when it's selfish? And ask for the Holy Spirit of God to deeply convict us in those moments and to choose to love each other in the way that Jesus loved. Talk about production. What is our life producing? When it comes to the fruit of love, what kind of love is your life producing? How are you loving? Is it loving simply based on feelings and cravings and emotions? Or are we loving like Jesus with sacrifice and service and surrender, selflessness? That's how he loved. A love that's not about us, but about others. A love that's modeled for us by Jesus. Here's the beautiful thing of the gospel. Is Jesus showed us how to love by the way he lived. But he also showed us how to love in the way that he died. He demonstrated it in the way that he lived, the way that he loved, the way that he served, the way that he washed feet and cared for but he also on the cross demonstrated for us how to love by being our ultimate sacrifice, by shedding his own sinless blood so that you and I could be right with God and that we could love others like he loved. Will you today choose to love like Jesus? Will you choose today to surrender your life to the gospel? When people ask me about our church, I've told you before, I try to I try to tell them we're a place of grace. I try to tell them we're for the Bible, for Jesus, for community, and for Greenwood. But my hope and my prayer and my dream for us as a people, as the body of Christ, was that they will know. They'll know the kind of place this is. They'll know the kind of people we are by the way that we love.